Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. So back at the end of March, I put a question up on my Patreon to my Patreon viewers, um, asking for suggestions of videos that they would like to see me make. And uh, one of the suggestions from Miguel Batican, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I've butchered your name, but uh, Miguel um, was one of the first people to comment. And uh, he commented or suggested a question which is something which actually other people have uh, requested that I cover in the past as well. And that is, what do I think about Warhammer 40k um, armour and weapons? Well, um, so I've thought about doing this video for a long time and the fact is that I don't know a huge amount about Warhammer 40k. Yes, I used to do uh, Warhammer when I was, um, when I was younger. Um, so I'm vaguely aware of the different species, the different types of army. You know, I know what Space Marines are, I know what Eldar are and all this kind of stuff. I know what a bolter and a chainsaw and all of these things are. So I'm vaguely aware, but I never actually really played 40k. Um, so I don't have an in-depth enough knowledge um, to talk in, in a huge amount of detail. But nevertheless, I thought it was worthy because I've asked, been asked so many times to talk about this um, to some degree. Why am I holding this sword? Well, quite simply, because I don't own any Warhammer 40k weapons. I don't have a heavy bolter or a chainsaw to hand. Um, and I kind of thought that this was maybe looked a bit like the hilt of a, uh, one of the swords you might find in, um, in 40k. First of all, I have to say, I really love the aesthetic of 40k. I love the way it looks. It's no um, surprise that it's been as popular as it has and why it's so iconic because Quite frankly, you know, Warhammer Games Workshop did something with the design of that world, of that universe, that, uh, not really a world, is it? It's uh, several worlds, um, a better universe, that um, really looks different to everything else. I know some of you will go, oh, there's this other thing that looks a bit like it, but fundamentally, I can't think of any famous um, medium bit, you know, books or movies or whatever, comics, that really look like what we see in um, Warhammer 40k. I suppose the closest to it might be something like Judge Dredd or something like that, that's at least the closest that's well known. But the weapons, well, there are a few that I can talk about. First of all, I'm not gonna talk about the, the gun type weapons because, you know, they all kind of make sense. But I am gonna say, having said I'm not gonna talk about them, I will say one thing about them. And that is the context of this entire universe that 40k is set in is that there is a lot of armor okay now as regular viewers of this channel will know when armor is involved in any type of conflict it it inextricably changes the weapons um, that you're going to use so for example um, the uh, sword behind me here the so-called Henry V sword or Westminster Abbey sword has a reinforced point um, and that reinforced point is specifically for penetrating um, um, we love penetration on this channel, but it's specifically for penetrating male and gambeson, uh, the kind of things that would be underneath or between plates in plate armor. So the very fact that plate armor is present means that the weapons adapt to fight against it. I'll grab another one behind the camera here, um, and that's a rondel dagger. This is from um, Todd's workshop, um, which I've done a review of um, previously. Uh, but this is a very specialized weapon. Everything about it is specialized from the pommel to the guard to the blade for armored fighting. So the point is that because in Warhammer world, or Warhammer universe, um, there is so much armor, not on, I accept not all of the different species wear lots of armor, but there is a lot of armor within that kind of, um, within that universe. We have to accept that the weapons would have to be able to deal with the armor. Now that's where guns come in, and this is the only thing I'm gonna say about the, the guns in there, and I'm calling them guns generically. I don't really wanna call them, you know, specifically rifles or things like that, because obviously a lot of them aren't shooting a rifle projectile. They're shooting other things, but some of them might be. Um, but the, the firearms, if we call them that, um, are in long weapon versions, um, so rifle equivalents, carbine versions, or shotgun equivalents, um, or, or carbine equivalents, um, and down to pistol equivalents. Now that makes sense, but what's inextricably um, sort of inherent to the design of those weapons is they must be able to um, counter effect the fact that there's very powered up and effective armor in use. And people have talked about, you know, when we talk about 
futuristic kind of scenarios where we imagine if body armor in our in the real world if body armor advances and let's face it it has if you look at what a modern nato soldier wears on campaign now wherever it is in the world um, compared to what they were wearing 30 40 years ago they are wearing so much more stuff now and a lot of that stuff is to protect them from incidental hits it might not protect them from direct hits although sometimes it might do stop a pistol round a lot of the stuff that's worn but won't necessarily stop a rifle round um, but they are nevertheless wearing degrees of armor what if that continued going further well if it continued going further the natural end point the evolution point is something as we see in warhammer 40k um, so the, you know something the space marine kind of um, image is you know what the ultimate powered up armored suit would be so the the firearms have to be able to deal with that if the armor just stops you know if you could stop modern rifles and pistols being effective against you because of the armor you're wearing well then the firearms would have to evolve to a point so that's where we end up with things like the the, the bolt guns and uh, shuriken pistols and stuff like that that are somehow supposed to overcome the armor that they're being used at just one thing those shuriken pistols used by eldar don't seem like an effective form of uh, firearm to me it seems like they would be vastly less effective at going through armor than something uh, with a, a more effectively shaped projectile shall we say but anyway moving on from the firearms i'm going to focus specifically on the hand-to-hand -hand weapons and really um, these come into um, a few different categories I suppose don't they so there are there are in Warhammer 40k as far as I'm aware the two most common types of hand weapon that you find apart from simple ones like just a knife um, which obviously bear in mind even if you're wearing the armor of a space marine um, armored fighting often devolves into grappling and something we have to acknowledge is that even in you know the real world if you're wearing full plate harness hand or muscle powered weapons are vastly less effective against someone who's wearing heavy plate um, harness a full plate harness um, to the point where you know two people can bash away at each other in battle of the nations in the modern world or in a historical in environment you know in full plate harness with um, pole axes or, um, or or any other type of hand weapon and be basically safe they might get a few bruises and that's it armor is extremely effective and the problem is while you can make um, while you can make armor more effective it's very difficult to make hand weapons more effective without um, introducing some type of you know electricity or some other type of um, power uh, shall we say to to that weapon because you can make the armor more and more and more effective but your muscles stay the same human capacity to inflict um, force energy on an implement can't really increase very much obviously a, an individual can make themselves stronger but even if you take someone like Hafthor Bjornsson Hafthor Bjornsson yes is a massive and hugely strong person but that's probably at about the top limit of what a human can be quite simply because of that's that's evolution that's the that's pretty much the most that our bodies can handle um, because you know we've got skeletons and usual constraints of, of physical um, physical uh, sort of limits to what we can actually achieve with our bodies so you can make the armor more effective so at some point and this is why warhammer 40k stuff comes into it there has to be an injection of something further beyond what just the human or elf or orc body can contribute to a hand weapon and you may say ah oh, but this is a fantasy world and in the fantasy world humans can be stronger and elves can be you know like elves in lord of the rings as well they can be stronger than they look like and and orcs could be hugely stronger than humans they could be like twice as strong it could be like gorilla strength or absolutely that's true but the rules of physics stay the same that for any species there is going to be a limit at which their body can not develop beyond that and therefore they cannot increase the effectiveness of their hand weapons this is why the only thing usually that overcomes armor is um, explosive weapons okay that's why in the modern world if you get tanks nobody has tried to design a sword that can cut through a tank except for the katana of course <laughs> but nobody has tried to design a sword that can cut through a tank 
because a sword is powered by human muscle, okay? Uh, whereas you can create a gun that can shoot through a tank because of course there's no, theoretically, no limit to which you can put greater amount of energy out of the muzzle of a gun. But you can't do that with something that's wielded in the hand. Um, but, so coming back to Warhammer 40k, so the weapons that are used in hand-to-hand -hand combat, what I was going to say is, with armour, remember there's always a way around armour. So even a space marine, okay, even a space marine who's got this massive powered up armoured suit, if you take their helmet off, if you get into a grappling scenario with them, which would happen, frankly, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you'd end up wrestling, both in your massive powered up suits. If you can wrench someone's helmet off, then at that point, then a simple kitchen knife becomes as lethal to them as, as a heavy bolter, you know, because you can stab them in the head or throat or whatever. So if you can get a part of their armour off in grappling, then you can stab them with anything, with a pointy stick if you like, although not in the UK because obviously pointy sticks are banned here. Um, but um, in, with the hand weapons that we normally see in Warhammer 40k, they've quite logically gone, okay, so we need hand weapons that are able to somehow damage this powered up armour, because it's like a, a rock, paper, scissors scenario. So the armour has got more and more and more powerful to resist normal firearms, and so the firearms have got more and more and more powerful and presumably, because hand weapons are still used in Warhammer 40k, rather than it just being firearms, there is a point at which they have found that the armour has progressed at a slightly better rate than the firearms can keep up with, yeah? Because otherwise, hand weapons, for the most part, wouldn't make sense. If the firearms were vastly more effective than the armour, then probably no one would, bo would bother with hand weapons. But if a lot of these shots from bolters and shuriken pistols and whatever are you know, bouncing off or just slightly damaging the armour or you know, definitely not killing the person, then that person's closing range. And remember, you can make the armour better, you can make the weapons better, but people still walk and run at the same speed, okay? The, for the most, okay, you could have powered up legs in your armour, but they're not running at 100 miles an hour, okay? They're presumably still running at maximum of, of kind of 15 miles an hour, probably less actually in all that armour. Um, and so they still move at the same speed. So if I'm closing on an opponent, um, imagine it was, you know, with a, a gun with a bayonet on the end, I'm closing on an opponent and they're shooting me, boom, 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 it's bad bouncing off my armour and I'm closing in. If my armour is good enough to take several shots, then indeed I will get into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay, So it's a, it's a rock, paper, scissors, it's an interrelated thing. The armour, the firearms, the hand weapons, they all connect together. So we've got into close combat range now. So we know that anybody can wrestle, or anybody can try and wrestle, doesn't mean they're good at it, like me, uh, not good at it, um, but anybody can come into grappling. And in armour, grappling's far more likely to happen in a unarmored, uh, yeah, in a, in a close combat situation because you're not going to be put out of action quickly. You know, an unarmed person, one stab can kill them. That's very unlikely to happen in armour. Okay, so armour, we come into close combat, bum, bum, bum. So we're there in our Space Marine armour or Eldar armour, whatever. Dark Reaper, even if you've got a big gun, blah, blah, blah. yes, I think, is that what they're called? Death Reaper, oh, I can't remember what they're called now. The Eldar guys with big guns. But anyway, any of these guys, they get into close combat, they've got really good armour on. Um, and now you need a hand weapon that's going to get through that armour. So we've got predominantly chain weapons. I know there's chain axes and chain swords and power swords and power axes. Okay. Now, I'm not certain of the science behind how the power swords and power axes are supposed to work. Feel free to comment underneath here. I imagine um, that <laughs> it's a kind of magic, basically, isn't it? It's a kind of ma no, it's it's got to be a kind of magic. Um, but if we apply it to science, it's essentially is it a some people have, if you look at Star Wars, for example, we go off on another uh, genre. Um, in Star Wars, they have vibro blades. Okay, this makes a kind of sense. My issue with vibro blades is they only really make sense if you apply something and then it's vibrating and you slice through it. The problem with hitting is the moment of impact is so is such a fraction of a second that really if the blade's vibrating or not probably isn't really going to make any difference whatsoever. So a power sword, what does it do? Okay, is it like a lightsaber? Does it does it somehow cut through things like like butter? Does it cut through 
by virtue of heat or energy dispersion or we don't really know okay we don't really i i don't know anyway i don't know if it's ever been written down what the exact science of a power sword or a power axe is but let's just assume that it's some type of energy capacitor that on impact discharges a load of energy into the target such that it cuts with far more energy than your simple hit. Okay, so if I'm applying however much, 100 joules to a strike, boom, when I actually hit it, the capacitor adds, I don't know, triples or quadruples the amount of force to the blow or something like that. That would make some kind of sense, but I have no idea how that would work. Now, clearly, that's a very simplistic way of making a sword that if I hit with let's say 100, 100 joules of energy, it actually dissipates 400 joules of energy into the target. That would be good, okay? However, if you're fighting against someone in armor, the rules of cutting, impact, and penetration with the point remain the same. And that's when we come back to medieval martial arts. We, regardless of how powered up your sword is, Assuming, well, assuming that it's as powered up at the point as it is at the edge and as it would be when it's blunt, trying to cut through armour that is itself powered up is probably the least effective thing you could do. So probably what we should see in Warhammer 40k, a greater use of penetrating weapons, okay? So we should see more spears, more lances. I know they do have spears and lances, but we should see the swords used predominantly for thrusting, I would say. Because if you're hitting a, a piece of armor, if your power sword is arriving at the target with a thousand joules of energy, okay, that is gonna be dissipated over an edge, okay, over an area. So, and that is clearly going to be less effective against the armor than if it was landing with a point because it's a smaller area. The laws of physics stay the same or they should stay the same. So by and large, I think power swords and power axes, it doesn't really work for axes. Axes are more of a bludgeoning weapon in that context. But let's, let's just focus on swords for a second. Power swords in Warhammer 40k should, in my opinion, be predominantly thrusting weapons, not cutting weapons. Okay. Some of you might say, oh, but you know, orcs and some of the other people, um, those tyranids and that kind of stuff, you need a cutting weapon. Yes, absolutely. So you could have a cut and thrust sword, okay? Just like a medieval sword like this behind me, this is still, this is still an effective cutting weapon and will still lop the legs and arms off things, but it has an enhanced point for fighting an armor. And that's what I believe a power sword in a Warhammer 48k context should be like. It should have a specialized point for piercing through and between armor, but still be effective at cutting for dealing with things which are not wearing armor, okay? Um, right, so um, on to the chain sword and chain axe, okay? I'm just gonna focus on the chain sword because what I'm gonna say applies to both. Generally speaking, they don't make a lot of sense, okay? Anybody who knows what a chainsaw is, what you cut trees down with, will hopefully have a rough idea of how they're used, okay? You crank up the engine, crank up the engine, okay? And then it's, the blade is going, spinning around, okay? It's spinning around here, it's a chain, hence the name. So it goes all around here. Usually one side is, uh, well, no, actually both sides are exposed, aren't they? But theoretically you could cover one side and just have the other side exposed. But anyway, it's a chain, a bit like a bicycle chain with teeth on it going around, okay? And you, usually place the edge because the motion is it is going up and down the blade this way you place the edge against the thing you want to cut and then apply pressure okay so what you're doing is a little bit like push or pull slicing with a kitchen knife when you're wanting to cut some mushrooms or something okay you don't just mash the edge straight into into the object you you place it against and then you push or pull to slice cleanly the slicing here is happening by virtue of the machine, which is pulling the teeth around the blade, okay? So it's going and it's sawing through. That doesn't work at all for a sword, okay? Yeah, absolutely, if you had such a sword with a, with a motor attached, and you could absolutely build one. I mean, it's just a chainsaw, isn't it? You could stick a sword hilt on a chainsaw. There's nothing stopping anyone from doing that. But to cut effectively, what you would want to do with it is place it against the edge of the thing that you're wanting to cut, relatively gently, because you don't want to break the chain, remember, chains are not that strong, although, yes, you could make a hugely big and strong chain, I accept that, and then apply pressure to it as it soars through. 
What they're not good at, if you get a chainsaw and you just go whack, the first thing that will happen is with a modern chainsaw, you'll probably break the chain, um, but it will probably stop cutting. It will not cut effectively at all because at that moment of impact, it's a bit like the power sword. You have a fraction of a second of impact with the chain with the chainsaw and then it might start cutting. But why did you give the impact? The actual impact, all that's likely to do is either damage the chainsaw or stop the motion because at that moment of going boom here, you're stopping the chain from going around for a split second. So you're messing with the whole motion. Okay. So not to say that I don't think you could make a chain sword that would work. Possibly you could, but you'd need to use it in a completely different way. You'd need to use it almost like delivering thrusts, I would say. So you, you'd probably start, I don't know why I'm imagining I've got a shield, let's imagine I've just got a, let's say I've got a pistol, there we go, I've got a pistol and a sword. You'd actually have to be going vroom, vroom, like this, um, sort of soaring up thing. Now obviously you could have the blade going, sorry, the, the motion of the teeth going that way or that way. Um, if it's coming downwards, then you'd be wanting to do draw cuts. And if it's going upwards, you'd be wanting to do push cuts. I would suggest that for a sword, for a weapon, well, I can see either of them working, but I, I personally think that push cuts would be more effective because you could start with a weapon close to you. And as your opponent comes near, you'd basically push saw into them rather than having to stretch the weapon out and pull saw back. But I accept either could work. And we see both done with conventional swords. You can do a push cut or you can draw, do a draw cut. So either's fine, but you would need to know was the motion of your teeth going downwards or upwards. And depending on that, you would have to attack differently. If my motion was going downwards, okay, if my teeth were going down here, okay, what you wouldn't want to do is a push cut because it would do nothing <laughs> because you would be moving in the same direction as the teeth. It would be like trying to walk up an, uh, an escal escalator. I don't know what you call that around the world, but the stairs that move up on a motor. It would be like trying to walk the wrong direction, up or down an escalator. Okay, so if the teeth were coming downwards, you'd have to stretch out the arm and then draw back, sort of like raking across the target. If they were going forwards, then you'd need to push into the target, okay? And if you got it the wrong way around, you wouldn't do any damage. And if you just hit, like you were just hitting with a baseball bat or a, an ax, then that wouldn't really do an awful lot at all because the motion of the blade wouldn't really add anything to that. So there we go, there's my overview. It was actually far more involved than I intended when I started talking, um, but there's my overview. Thank you to Miguel again on Patreon. Um, just to remind everyone, I have extra videos and questions and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes behind the scenes stuff as well on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon below if you want to um, support this channel, the public channel, or if you just want to get extra content, three videos a month on Patreon there. But there's my overview of um, Warhammer 40k close combat weapons. I'm aware that there's many more weapons that I haven't covered. Maybe I will in a future video, but to me the two predominant types that I'm aware of are the power weapons and the chain weapons, and they're the most iconic, I think, and the ones that people think of. So there we go. I hope that's been somewhat interesting, and remember that armour changes everything, and weapon development and armour development go hand in hand. Cheers for watching! Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.